In January, Theranos founder Elizabeth Holmes was convicted on four fraud charges in her highly publicized criminal trial. Now, Holmes's former top deputy and ex-boyfriend, Ramesh Sunny Balwani, is about to go on trial for similar charges of defrauding investors and patients about the startup's blood testing capabilities. Balwani has pleaded not guilty. He is a really important supporting character in the tale of Theranos. He was the person closest to Elizabeth Holmes, the star of Theranos, for the entire time that she ran the company. Prosecutors say that Theranos' blood testing technology didn't work as promised, and that Holmes and Balwani lied to attract more investments as the company ran out of cash. As the trial gets underway, here's an overview of Balwani's alleged role at Theranos and a look at what's to come in his criminal fraud trial. Balwani faces federal charges nearly identical to those in Elizabeth Holmes's case. Two counts of conspiracy to commit wire fraud and 10 counts of wire fraud. In the end, one of those charges was dropped against Elizabeth Holmes due to an error by the prosecution. It was a charge related to a patient that had taken a Theranos test, although Mr. Balwani and his team are fighting to get that charge dropped as well. Balwani met Holmes when she was a teenager and jointly ran Theranos with her as chief operating officer. Holmes and Balwani were also in a romantic relationship that spanned more than a decade, growing and fading alongside the rise and fall of Theranos. Former employees said Balwani enforced a corporate culture of secrecy and fear until his departure in the spring of 2016. He was not the ultimate decision maker, as she was, but he was the chief operating officer and he oversaw the lab. So he had tremendous influence and tremendous power at Theranos. Through witnesses and evidence, the prosecution and defense portrayed him as a complicated figure who both contributed to and tried to remedy problems at Theranos. So we have a really conflicting picture, I think, from Ms. Holmes' trial about how much Mr. Balwani may have contributed to the many problems at that lab because of his leadership, and also how much he tried to perhaps fix some of the problems. And I think it will be really interesting to see the extent to which that is cleared up in Mr. Balwani's trial. Holmes testified that Balwani was in charge of the lab operations and financial projections shared with investors as president and chief operating officer. The defense argued that Holmes believed she was telling the truth about Theranos because she relied on Balwani for accurate information about the company's operations. So there was a lot of testimony to show that the lab had a lot of problems, and a lot of those problems seemed to be traced back to Mr. Balwani. We also saw text messages and emails and other pieces of evidence that suggested that he was very passionate about the company and really did take efforts at times to try to remedy the problems. The prosecution also called several witnesses who revealed how Balwani treated Theranos employees. Former lab worker Erica Chung testified that Balwani rebuffed her attempts to raise concerns about Theranos' technology. From the witnesses called by the prosecution, specifically former employees of Theranos, I think we got a consistent picture that Mr. Balwani is not a nice guy. Uh, he's a guy with a short temper, a short fuse. He could be really hard on employees. He challenged people such as a former lab worker, Erica Chung, about why she was raising questions about lab practices. The defense and prosecution also showed hundreds of text messages that offered a glimpse into Balwani's romantic and business relationship with Holmes. They show, really, the complexity of their personal relationship and also how intertwined their personal relationship was with their business one. And the messages also show, importantly, the influence Mr. Balwani tried to have over how Ms. Holmes ran the business. In many cases, it's trying to correct things that are wrong with the company. For instance, saying, we need FDA clearance. That 2015 text message referred to clearance from the Food and Drug Administration, which would declare the company's signature nanotainers to collect finger-pricked blood, an uncleared medical device. In a separate message, he said the company's lab was a disaster zone. And the prosecution was able to use those text messages at times to show that there were problems at this company that Elizabeth knew about, that she was informed of. A pivotal moment in Holmes' testimony came when she accused Balwani of emotional and sexual abuse. She claimed Balwani controlled all aspects of her life, including how much she should eat and sleep and when she could see family and friends. A lawyer for Balwani denied the abuse allegations. At the end of the day, she said in her testimony that while she blamed him for exerting 
control over aspects of her life. Elizabeth testified that Mr. Balwani did not have control over what she said to investors about the company, over what she said to business partners, or over what she said to journalists. Pre-trial court filings from Balwani's attorneys could also offer insight into what's to come in his criminal trial. In one November 2021 filing, Balwani's defense team sought to limit evidence involving patients, including the results of tests that were performed using non-Theranos diagnostic equipment. The judge denied that request. In order for Balwani to be found guilty, the prosecution must prove beyond a reasonable doubt he had the intent to defraud patients or investors about the efficacy of Theranos' blood testing technology. So in the case of investors, that Mr. Balwani told a lie that was significant enough that investor thought, oh, well, that's great. I'm going to invest in that company. And that might have been a revenue projection or a claim about their relationship with Walgreens, the pharmacy chain. That wasn't true, but that was appealing enough that it caused an investor to write them a check.